right. We are recording. Awesome. Hey. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here virtually. Um, Azra and I are really excited. Um, my name is Catherine. I am y'all's president and I am a youth services librarian at the Force of Public Library. Okay, and I'm Azra Palo. I'm the head of youth services at the Nesmith Library. I'm the CLNH president for this year, and I'm also the social media coordinator for NHLA. Um, so I just wanted to take a really quick second to let you all know that we have another y'all's event coming up next month um, that we're excited about in lieu of our fall conference. We have um, what we are calling Get Lit, which is um, going to be an afternoon of various, various publishers who are going to be talking to us about upcoming um, YA books, which we are very excited about. And we have an exciting keynote speaker as well, Julie Dow. Um, and information will be sent out, I think, today to members. So keep it your eyes on your email. Did you have anything you wanted to um, plug, Azra? Or I think uh, we've kind of at CLNH been doing things sort of based on our membership. So in the spring, we did the Facebook Live and the recorded story time. So based on what people are talking about here, we'll do future programming. Um, and also, don't forget, uh, Neela is having their continuing conference, and they do have some children's related um, events going on. So keep an eye on that. Yeah, awesome. Um, so we're going to start. We have some people who have submitted really incredible programs they're going to share. Um, and I'm super excited to hear about all of them. Um, just a quick note, we, we know that every library is, is operating a little bit differently right now. Um, so we just ask everyone, you know, stays respectful and um, sort of keep that in mind. You might have to adapt these programs to how your library is currently operating and handling COVID, um, and that's okay. Um, and I think with that, we are good to start, unless you have anything else that I forgot, Azra. No, just definitely stressing the respectful part. Um, you know, I've been really grateful to our community for always being open, but I know things can get a little bit testy sometimes, especially when we're talking about hot topics, but today we're trying to keep it on future programming. So hopefully that won't get too hot. Um, so just keep that in mind. Great. All right, so to start off our um, sort of mini presentation, um, we have a Megan from the Hill Library in Stratford, and she's going to be talking. And is Mar uh, Mars Madden with you here too today? Um, she's not here with me today, okay. but she is my volunteer uh, silent partner. <laughs> well, we to hear from Megan, so take it away, Megan. All right. Um, my name is Megan. I'm the Youth Service Librarian at Hill Library in Stratford, New Hampshire. Um, I have a PowerPoint that I have created. I just hit the screen share, right? Yeah, I think, let me just make sure you have the, should be able to oh. do it. Yeah. All right. Um, I have started a children's community garden at Hill Library. Um, Pre-pandemic, um, I was planning on creating um, a children's garden with our Stratford Youth and Community Club. Um, but as we all know, things change once the pandemic started, we weren't able to have programs. So uh, we started uh, April 21st um, of Clearing the Land. Um, our original mission of this project was to provide hands-on educational and social emotional programming for children that would impact their community positively through multi-generational relationships, sharing knowledge of agriculture and permaculture. And we were going to do that by creating ownership for the children that attend Stratford Youth and Community Club and the creation and decisions made for the Children's Community Garden. Um, we're planning on donating all the produce to the Stratford Food Pantry that um, was harvested. And um, we wanted to invite guests to implement programs and topics such as plants, permaculture, pollination, nutrition, composting, entomology, beekeeping, and more. 
Wow. Um, but this is a picture here of our youth and community club. Um, we I invited different guests of the community that either did something to improve the community or had a special skill to teach the children. Um, this is a picture of the N68 Hours of Hunger coming to present their program and the children bagged all of the food for that week for the children that needed it in the surrounding area. Um, after the pandemic happened, um, our original mission still was there, um, but we just had to adapt it. Um, and so we adapted it by beginning the project with adult volunteers to clear the land and start the garden beds. Um, we weren't able to have programs or have children in, so we had to start it, unfortunately. Um, and then we decided to change it into implementing family programs in garden tours with social distancing in place. Um, this picture is a picture of a family um, that came to harvest one of the first harvestings. Um, and um, they came and they um, had a garden tour um, and they were able to um, harvest with me there as well. Um, the other thing about um, having the pandemic happened is that, as you all know, we are on a budget um, with our town. And so we're trying to make the project as cost effective as possible. So we used volunteers. Um, we got endorsed by the Stratford Garden Club. And we have other um, members of the community that are a part of um, the process. And uh, we also have uh, the Stratford um, Master Gardeners that are helping us as well um, as resources. Um, we use permaculture, um, which I'll go further into in a moment, but it's just basically using natural resources that are already found on the site. So the pictures that you'll see coming up, um, all of the um, materials that you'll see, um, most of them are from right on site that we recycled and reused. Um, for the garden beds, we decided to do lasagna garden beds, um, which is basically layering the organic material on top of each other to create rich and healthy soil. Um, and that way we didn't have to dig into the soil that was already there. Um, we created using the things found on site. We've used donations um, from community members um, and we've also been doing a lot of grant writing. Um, this project is the um, short term project right now, but we're planning on creating um, a bigger long term goal as the years go by. Um, these are some pictures of our volunteers. Um, we have Morris as the first picture, um, watering a garden. Um, and we had um, a gentleman that lives near the library um, named Wynn, and he is an 80 year old man that put all of us to shame. <laughs> um, he would try um, to work like eight hour days of trying to um, prepare the land so that we could start building our uh, garden beds. And he, um, ended up letting us use all of his equipment and taught us how to ride the tractors and how to back up with the trailer, um, which I'm still practicing, um, but it's been really fun and insightful and I've learned a lot from, um, from both of them. Um, and the picture on the far right is of um, our director, Paige um, Holman, driving one of the tractors. <laughs> Um, this is before the earthwork happened. Um, we had a lot of invasive um, trees uh, northern maples along the fence lines that we had to pull out. Um, and this is after the earthwork. And um, we ended up using all of the materials um, that we pulled out. Um, oh, Megan, I'm for... going to pause. Oh, yeah. I think we lost your slideshow. Do you mind trying to share your screen one more oh. time? Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry about that. No worries. There it goes. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So sorry about that. No worries. Um, this is a family that we had for a family program that um, was able to be a part of the whole process of the lasagna garden bed. Um, so in the first picture in the top left, left is um, of the two girls. They are breaking down cardboard to put down on the, as a main level. I mean, um, uh, yeah, um, and basically after that, they put on the brown matter, which you see on the right slide after that, and then down on the bottom left, they started putting um, some more green matter and um, finish it off with some loam and compost. And they created a heart garden, which is our current nursery garden, 
um, where we have kind of like a different um, different selections of plants, um, which you'll see in a moment. Um, so going off of permaculture, um, it's utilizing nature as a foundation by using natural resources to create a sustainable and regenerative design. And so that kind of goes along with the lasagna garden bed um, of creating our own um, resources through that. This is a picture of our keyhole garden, um, which we, the adults actually created this one as a model. Um, so the cinder blocks we found on site, um, we found the logs on the side and all the rocks and the materials that we used to create the lasagna garden bed. Um, this is a picture of a couple of families that have come to uh, create different garden structures um, using the materials found on site. Um, we had some peas that were made, um, that were grown into, um, on the far left, you'll see um, a family creating um, kind of like a teepee to be able to have the peas grow up and over. Um, the little boys in the middle there created um, a teepee for green beans to grow up and over, where they can sit in the middle there and eat green beans and read a book. <laughs> um, the bottom right picture, um, was is a um, one of our patrons who um, really wanted to create his own fire pit inside his teepee, and so you'll see what he ended up doing later in another picture. Um, this is our little um, area where we have all our natural materials for um, creating things. So we have um, three compost bins that were donated. Um, the blue one is a tumbler that we use for regular composting, and the other two black ones we're going to use to create our own um, green and brown matter that will help uh, create um, the rich soil needed for years to come. Um, we also have on the far left in the corner you'll see is our like stick and log pile. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that. And you'll see the keyhole garden in the far in the back. Um, if you see where the bird fee, uh, bird house is, um, where the wood chips are, um, we ended up having a volunteer um, break down all of the trees that we had along the fence line to um, utilize that for um, the pathway. So we didn't have to weed that. <laughs> be too much work. And here he is uh, chipping it right here. This is the keyhole garden. Lots of vegetables that are growing, we try to make it as symmetrical as possible. And we have such things as um, radishes and beets and carrots, um, 18 tomato plants, <laughs> which is quite a lot, um, peppers, and um, we have borage and other herbs. Um, we have chives and different squashes um, inside this garden. Um, these are some family program pictures, just to show all their hard work. And for the food pantry, um, we have donated about 40 pounds of produce um, to date. And the picture that you see right here is um, a collection from last week where we were able to harvest 26 pounds. And here are just a couple of garden pictures for your pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Wow. And that is the end of that presentation. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? Are, are you a gardener? I am kind of a gardener, but I, um, I've been learning a lot, which is awesome. Um, I, my parents, I kind of grew up gardening with them, um, but I've learned a lot from different members of the community and um, just kind of building those relationships with them has been really nice. Yeah, because I'm not a gardener and I was feeling a little bit intimidated seeing those photos. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, <laughs> makes me well, feel yeah, well, the one thing that I really um, took home is that we had um, a master gardener come on site before we even started, um, and she introduced us to permaculture and how to become more cost effective. 
And one um, quote from her that's really resonated for me and for Maris is to strive for a small success, not a large failure. And so we just kind of decided we're going to do what we can this year and just learn from what we've done and continue to let it grow for the next year. So, yeah. It looks like Carla has a question. Um, does putting down cardboard help with weed prevention? It does. It actually breaks, it um, smothers everything that's on the ground. And so when you layer up the different materials, um, you don't have as many weeds. Um, not saying that you don't have weeds, but it definitely helps. Um, because sometimes in the compost or in the loam, you'll have different things that are kind of already present in there. So after you're done, you know, weeding out what's been there, um, it's pretty easy. Welcome. <laughs> oh, um, was it difficult to get approval from the trustees to start the garden? Um, it wasn't actually. They were um, all for it. Um, and it kind of gave me something to do in the beginning when we were closed to patrons and trying to figure out what we're doing and what um, processes we we're going to do to open up. Um, strangely enough, I was um, offered a full time position right when the COVID happened. <laughs> so I was like, how am I going to do 40 hours at home when we don't have programs? <laughs> and so I was able to um, be able to start that process and have that as a project as well as I've been doing online story times um, as well. Mm -hmm. um, is the garden on the library campus. It's actually right next to the library. Um, so we have a plot of land that the town bought that um, was just collecting dust. Nobody was doing anything. And so um, I came up with the idea of the community garden and um, it just kind of went from there. And um, our um, the, um, the town folks, the um, selectmen, they're all in favor of this happening as well. So. Good. Yeah. I'm gonna see if I missed any other questions. No, I think that's good for the chat. Could you put your email in the chat? Yeah, of course. Awesome. Well, that's really amazing, Megan. I'm like very inspired by you right now. That's very, really Thank cool. Thank you. Um, oh, one last question before we move on. Um, was it hard to engage the families? Um, in the beginning, it was because I feel like a lot of families were just done with remote learning and all that stuff. And that's kind of how I was able to publicize the community garden. Um, and so a lot of it had to be like word of mouth. And then once people started hearing about it, and we put it out on the sign near the road and stuff. Um, we ended up getting a lot of people interested. Um, so we've had about um, nine different family programs so far. Um, and a few of them have been repetitive ones. Um, and then we've had lots of volunteers that are really interested in just kind of seeing it. Um, so I've been doing a lot of garden, garden tours. I just had a tour with 10 people from a uh, book club from in town uh, that came to, to visit um, the other day, which was really nice. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. That's amazing. Of course. Thank you for inviting. Yeah. All right. Um, so next up, we have let me make sure Sue from the um, Pillsbury Free Library. Um, do you, Hi, everybody. Hello. Do you need to share your screen Hi. at all, or? No, I don't have a great a great screen like Megan did. I'm impressed. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. I, didn't yeah, think, I didn't even think to put my pictures on, but you guys can use your imagination. We're good at that. So um, I did. Um, because I wanted to do a summer program. And as we know, everything got closed down. And I thought, like you said, Megan, these kids have been on the computer finishing up school and parents did not want that. Um, so I kind of racked my brain, tried with the, because we have a park right next door. And I thought, well, if we have like, give it, everybody bring a bath towel, maybe they would all sit on their towel and it would work. Um, but when I contacted the park, they had canceled all of their programs and they just felt uncomfortable thinking, you know, why are they letting the library do something and not the rest of the community and all the performers and stuff. So I said, you know, I'm not going to do that. So I racked my brain, racked my brain. And finally, I came up with what I called the drive in theater. Um, and so right across the street, 
is the uh, New Hampshire Telephone Museum, and they have a pretty good sized parking lot. And obviously they, at the time, weren't open when I started planning, but then they did open, but they you know, didn't have a whole lot of business at the moment. So um, they let me use the parking lot. Um, so that was the first thing that you, you have to have is some place to do it. Um, and then I decided that since it was outside, I really wanted to have a microphone. Um, and certainly on one side, um, there is an outlet and a friend of mine had a microphone set up um, that he offered to let me use. So I had that. So, you know, you do need a few things to be able to do this. Um, and then my teen helper, which was great that she was here again this year, um, we have to carry everything. So you do have a few things, you know, a few challenges you have to, you know, jump over before you can start. But um, we, managed and actually the weather cooperated which was great i mean it was hot and humid but um i only had one kind of drizzly day and the rest of it worked out great so basically um and again like you megan um you know i didn't have the schools to send out my brochures i didn't have you know a lot you know many people weren't coming out so i didn't have a whole lot of stuff to put out into the world. Um, and so I basically, word of mouth, I think was the main thing. Um, our website, you know, Facebook, all of that, like, like all of us use, um, that was basically all I had. And I ended up getting approximately half of what I normally would get for my summer program. Um, and so it worked out really well. I had people sign up ahead. So I kind of have a general idea of how many kids each time. And parents would drive in, and most of them have SUVs and vans. So it worked out really well where they would drive into a parking place and open up their hatch. And then the kids would sit on the back hatch. Um, some of my parents who had cars, they would drive in and they brought a blanket and the kids sat on a blanket right at the end of their car. So it really worked out well in that they were very spaced. Everybody stayed in their own spot. Um, I sat on the other side of the parking lot and I brought a stool and I brought over every time I do one of my summer programs, I read a book. Um, and the older ones love it just as much as the young ones. And so I said, I'm not gonna stop doing that. So I had the microphone in one hand and the book in the other. And sometimes if it was windy, my teen would help hold the book for me. Um, and you know, we just did our normal book thing and everybody saw it fine, they could hear me. Um, and so basically I read my story, um, the parents, were concerned because normally when I have my summer program, it's my older kids in terms of elementary age. Um, but I said, no, you're coming in your car. Of course you can bring your younger ones. I mean, they miss out on story time. We have a, a virtual, you know, I do it on Zoom, but um, this way they get to see me, they get to be in person, they got to have a story time too. So the whole family was there. Um, it worked out well, moms and ever, whoever was watching the kids that day got to have a story time too. Um, so it worked out really well. Um, I was impressed that parents really enjoyed it. Um, and so we just did story time and then I had to bring everything with me. Oh, and that's what I forgot to tell you. When we first started, um, because of the whole COVID thing, we didn't want, you know, we're not gonna make the projects there, first of all, but we're not gonna share materials. So I gave everybody, I collected cardboard boxes, um, shoe boxes, cardboard boxes, and I put in markers and scissors and glue sticks and passed those out to all the kids. So everybody had their box because I, you know, I didn't want anyone to feel bad if they didn't have materials at home. Um, so everybody got a box and um, I passed those out the first day so that they were ready to do their projects. And then um, we brought over all the project materials. Um, you know, like if we were doing dragons that day, I had all the dragons cut out and I had all the things they needed to do whatever they were going to do with it. And um, then they we passed them out with our gloves and our masks and passed them to each individual car and they took them home and, and did their projects. 
um, the one thing we all missed out on was the sharing. I mean, we, you know, we got to see each other and that was great. And, and I shared my story, but normally we all get to create at the same time and see what everybody else is doing. Um, so on the last day, instead of our party and our big event, um, I had everyone bring several of their projects back. And um, I had the kids walk up towards me and I helped narrate and they got to show their projects to all their friends. Um, so that was really nice. Um, and they all, you know, showed different things. Um, the other thing we did, it did was um, normally I have a wall where we, every time we read and they hand in their slips and that kind of thing every week, we um, would put something on the board and it would just fill up the board. Um, and I, I know the kids love to see their name up on the board. So I thought, what am I going to do? So what I did was I made um, a big dragon and um, I have four window panes that are kind of together in a square. So we had four parts of the dragon. Um, and every time a child handed in their reading slip, they got to put a dragon scale on the dragon and filled it in. And plus they get to see their name outside, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, um, we did that and that was really nice. They loved it. And to the point where we had a little drawing out of a, a box to name our dragon and our name is Puff the magic dragon. So our dragon is Puff. Um, so he's still in my window because the kids love seeing their name out there with the scales and stuff. So that was fun. So we didn't miss out too much on what I normally do. And um, the other thing was the quote prizes that, you know, we, we like to stimulate the reading a little bit, but um, I'm not a big, big prize person, but I know the kids enjoy it and, and see the reward of, of their reading. So um, I did those brag tags. Um, and so what we did was we gave everybody a brag tag and their chain and everything else the first day. And what I decided was every five books or so, or depending on you know what age level they're at, they would get so many of those pony beads. And then after 25 or whatever, 20 or 25, um, they got another brag tag. Um, so I did that and what we would do is we would um, stuff baggies um, my teen helper and myself. Um, and then when we met the next day, I would, um, we would pass those to them. So they kept getting their, their brag tags and their, and their pony beads. Um, so we did that and, um, I've got nothing but great feedback. Um, I'm not sure if I will be able to use that for some of my programs during the year. Obviously the weather makes a difference. Um, but it was very successful and parents actually felt less chaotic, which was an interesting comment, I thought. Um, you know, because usually you get the whole crowd coming into the library and then everybody has to get their books and do all that. Um, and we are doing curbside. That was the other thing is we do have curbside service right now. Um, the library is still not open. Um, and so um, I had to remind them that they have to order ahead because we like to sit them in the bags um, for a day and then they can get their books. So um, that was the only little drawback is they did have to be patient for their books. Um, so I think that's everything, um, but it was great. Um, uh, what are my question, Ben, this is a little, as we were considering a similar part, did you wear a mask? Did you ask patrons to wear masks? Um, the only time we wore masks, Ben, um, was when we handed stuff to them and I even wore gloves um, just because I know it makes it, it made everybody feel better. Um, the only problem I had was that being outside in the summer, oh my gosh, there were a couple of days where the sweat was just dripping off me because I was sitting in the hot sun and it was humid. Um, I couldn't get my gloves on. Um, so basically I just said, you know, if you don't mind, I'm not going to put my gloves on. I can't put my gloves on. Um, I said, you know, I washed my hands before I got here and that kind of stuff. So, um, basically I wore a mask only when I was handing stuff out. Um, when I was reading the story, I mean, I mean, they could have heard me, but I didn't because our distance was enough. Um, I was a good car length away. Um, 
and they were in their cars, basically sitting on the bumpers of their cars. So I did not wear a mask except to hand things out. Yeah. You mentioned you gave patrons a box of craft supplies. Do they keep them or return them? If they return, do they sanitize each of them? I only had, um, cause we, you know, you know, you're not gonna get some of it back. And, and at that point it didn't matter, but um, I had three boxes come back, um, which is not many, but um, I just chalked it up to summer program. I mean, I didn't pay for a performer. Um, so, um, they sat, I, I sat them for a little while, um, you know, for a few days and then I kind of just put them back into my circulation. Well, not circulation because there's nothing circulating. It's sitting in the back in the cabinet. Um, so I did not get many back and I didn't ask them for them back. Just one of those things they got to keep. Uh, what did you use for a sound system with your mic? Okay. My, um, guy <laughs> who his name is Chris um he has a microphone with a small little speaker amplifier um and he had it all set up so all I did was I had all I had to do was push the button um, plug it into the wall and push the button um it was very basic um and it was more than enough I asked parents if they had any problem hearing me they said no so it was just a very simple setup um so I got to borrow that that was good um, so that's it. Great, thanks, Sue. Awesome. Any other You're welcome. questions? That sound that sounds great. A nice way to yeah, it was fun. Yeah, awesome. All right. Um, so I am actually going to um, chat next um, on behalf of a colleague who is unable to be here today. Um, just really quickly about a couple of our summer programs that um, we are considering doing in the fall again that worked really well. Um, we are currently sort of weighing the um, remote. Portsmouth is likely going to be doing mostly remote schooling, so we're unsure how many virtual programs we want to offer. I'm sure many of you are having the same conversation um, because students are getting zoom burnout but these with that being said these were two um, zoom programs that we offered this summer that worked really well the first one um, was one that my colleague molly ran um, and she, it was called summertime scribes um, we will be rebranding it for fall if we continue but it was a writing program for grades three to five um, it was eight weeks long she had 10 students and there actually was um, Quite a bit of a wait list as well and all the students attended every week they were very engaged um, she had a different prompt each week which was um, some of the examples um, kooky characters fractured fairy tales um, she had a lot of games where they would like roll a virtual dice or die and whatever number they got they had to do a certain prompt she also had two authors come, which was really exciting. So um, Audie Rule and Lisa Bunker, who are both um, New Hampshire authors, both have spoken, I think, at y'all. So many of you have probably seen them speak before. Um, they very graciously volunteered their time and they popped into a couple different sessions and chatted with the kids about what it means to be an author um, and the writing process. So that was really amazing. Um, so that's the first one. Um, and then the second one that I wanted to mention was one that we offered for students in grades three to five, as well as um, students in middle school. We had two different sessions and that was an escape room design workshop, which was super fun. Um, we used Breakout EDU, which does cost money to purchase the platform. Um, you have the license for a full year. And that's something we had purchased previously because we were doing in-person um, escape rooms, but it actually translated really well to the virtual space. So they had, um, they have videos. Um, we didn't really use them because of time constraints. We sort of um, used our own stuff. Um, and the students really loved that. Um, it was four weeks. We're thinking if we offer it again, we'll do it a little longer. Um, because that wasn't a whole ton of time to um, to plan the rooms. And I just really quickly wanted to, if GoToMeeting will let me, it won't, my laptop's too old, Never mind. Um, I was going to show you one of the escape rooms that the students had made, which was really incredible. Um, but you can use your imagination, as Sue said, because my laptop is not cooperating, unfortunately. Um, 
So those were both really successful um, school-age programs. And the Escape Room Design for Middle School Students, I think, was our most popular um, tween teen program this summer as well. Um, oh, yeah. Did they make them as a group or individual? So we let the students pick because we wanted it to be um, really student-driven. And so it's actually interesting because the younger group um, decided that they wanted to all work together on an escape room. And then the older group decided that they wanted to each make their own. Um, and Gretel and I, I think it was a lot easier for us to, for the older crew because um, working together to design an escape room on Breakout EDU is not um, the easiest. Gretel, I think, ended up putting in a lot of work taking their ideas and translating that into clues. Um, and then the for the uh, middle school students, they kind of had time to work on their own. And then they got to share their escape room with everyone else, um, which I think was a really awesome component because they could share their work and the other students got to play the games. Um, yes, breakout EDU. And um, I'm happy to send along my notes, which are much more detailed than I am currently um, describing, if anyone is interested. And I'm sure Molly would also be um, more than happy to share any information about Summertime Scribes. I'll put both of our emails there in the chat. Um, yeah, any questions? I'm a very fast talker, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, that's a good question, Sue. And I think Gretel just popped on. I, I can't remember. I feel like it was around $150 for a year license and the kit. So you get like a physical breakout box kit, um, which we've used a couple times pre-COVID. Does that sound right, Gretel? I don't know if she's here. Um, but yeah, I think it was around $150. And we purchased it back in December. So we've had it for a bit. Sound right for the initial. And then usually after the first year. Well, you're breaking up a little bit. I think if you renew it. And I think after the first year, you get a discount on the platform access. Once you have the kit, like the $150 is for. I think that's right. So once we go to renew our license, it will, it will be a little less because we already have the physical supplies. Um. That's a good question, Ashley. Uh, she said, asked if um, you can share the rooms or games with Breakout EDU. Um, so originally I was gonna try and just paste her game in the chat and it won't let me share it because she created it in our class. So the way that it works is you set up classrooms um, in Breakout EDU. So um, once a student submitted a game, I could then assign it to the rest of the class. So the students in the class could see the game, but I couldn't share it with you right now because it's not published on the breakout EDU like platform as a whole, if that makes sense. Um, so they can share it with their peers, but we couldn't like say post it on our social media to have other people do, which is actually kind of unfortunate. Are there any other questions about either of those programs? Awesome. I'll um, put my email in the chat in just a second. Um, Moving right along, um, I think Krista Bordelieu from the Pelham Library is up next. Hey everyone. Yep, so I'm from the Pelham Library and we normally have a ton of teens come. Our library is located right across the street from the middle school. So it's normally a lot of sixth, seventh graders and then like a few eighth graders um, who just keep coming back year after year. Um, so we have had to brainstorm what the safe in our our town, the kids are going back. They had a choice of doing 100% um, remote or go back to school regular with masks and, and stuff like that. So we have to expect that there's going to be some kids that come and need to use the library. There's not like a Y or um, after school programs and they're not doing any of their their sports. So we had to think and figure out what would be the best thing for keeping the kids safe and giving them a place to go. Um, so we decided to do, um, our trustees and the director um, decided to enact a teen time for the kids. So every um, Monday through Friday from 2.30 to 5, the building is going to be um, 
it's good. The doors are still going to be locked and I'm going to be outside and, and let the kids in, but we're allowed to have up to 18 kids in the library for quiet study, working on homework, waiting for their guardians. And we have a mask policy and social distancing and all of that, but it's just a place for them to go while they wait. Um, and they're normally we would have themed programs each day during non COVID time. So Monday was always Pokemon. Tuesday was always like a self care mental health activity. Wednesday was always food. And then Thursday was crafts and Friday was gaming. Um, COVID has put a wrench in this style of programming, but the kids are definitely getting antsy for some sort of programming. Uh, we do discord. So we know that the kids, they talk to us a lot on that platform and we know that they do want some sort of programming. So I had to get really creative on how we we're still going to be there for them and give them something fun and safe to do after school if they can't go home. So we decided to do as well, as long as the weather it cooperates, at least hopefully through October, um, grab bags and activity style programming. Um, I wanted to keep it as close with the teens remember remember from last year. So we're still gonna do like Monday as Pokemon Go because it's still huge in Pelham and our library is a gym. I think most libraries are gyms. Um, so we're gonna set lures and we're gonna put um, print out like origami instructions to make the little Pokemon monsters and other like Pokemon kits and activities we find hopefully free online. Um, Tuesday, we're going to do Tuesday and Thursdays are going to be craft kits and I'm hoping for Tuesday to be more like a traditional craft kit, a bracelet, scratch art, picture frames, rock cactus, and then Thursday is going to be a science STEM related craft. We do binoculars, um, DOI cameras, telescopes, planting, and our emerging tech librarian Leanne has offered to help do some of those. Um, and we have been researching kits and stuff on, has everyone heard of Oriental Trading? Um, that's where we're getting most of our kits from and they're awesome because they come pre-packaged already um, and it's really great because you just literally open the box, put them in a plastic baggie, you know, label them and you're good to go. So we got a lot of them from Oriental to Trading and then a few from Amazon. I have a really small budget so it's really, it's really cost effective and it was, it was nice to be able to splurge a little bit on the fall grab bags knowing I don't have to pay for a presenter or anything like that. Um, and then Wednesday we're going to do like chalk and sports and toys and stuff like that. We have, uh, it's called Village Green. So there's like a big green space that we're allowed to use. And then it's like a, like a roundabout type style in Pelham. So the kids come and they can be on the green. And so it, there's a safe place for them to do all these activities and have the sports and stuff. And we're going to um, rope off some of the parking lot for them to do some of the activities. Um, we got like kites, some beach balls, some more sports equipment because like there's a park a little ways away that we let them take basketballs and stuff to and they're always pretty good at returning but we do have the expectation that some are just going to be lost to Pelham somewhere. Um, and then every Friday we're going to do a make and take um, snack kit. I'm thinking like a s'mores or a candy sushi, something like that. Um, just so they have a little sense of normalcy and um, all these kits are not allowed to bring them in the building. They're going to have to do them outside or when their parents pick them up, but it's just at least something to give them. And all of them are going to be in plastic baggies um, and we're going to put like a big table outside and keep social distancing that way where I'll be at one end and the kids can be at the other end to grab their craft kit. Um, and then we're going to try to theme all of the kits to weekly challenges that we'll send out through our newsletter or through Discord. And um, we'll do like scavenger hunts or like there's a Yeti hunt that you can get on Etsy. I think I learned about in one of these meetings in, in the springtime. So we're definitely gonna do that. We'll do a, a photo challenge series um, that they can, they can post their photos that they do with the cameras we're gonna give them on um, their Discord channel. And then we'll do like, um, a foreign candy taste test kit. I've seen a lot of libraries be doing that on underground and I'm uh, really excited to see which candies they like the most. Um, and I think, I think that's it. I think we haven't done it yet, but um, we've been doing craft kits all summer long. So I'm hoping that it goes just as smoothly as it's gone so far. Um, is your library closed in this team? So the, the library is locked, but we're going to allow kids to come in the library. But we normally ex we normally have like 20 to 30 kids on an average day after school. We can't have that many in the building because our building with social distancing, I think at max it can have 18 kids and we have like tables set up with chairs um, and, and places where they can go. But we know that they're going to get filled um, we're expecting it to get filled really fast. So I wanted to give them something when they can't make it into the building to do outside. Um, 
So I'm ho I'm hoping it's successful. The craft kits have been fun and the kids have been really coming and having their parents pick them up. We have a Google Voice that they text you a lot. We have the Discord that we um, get that we get the word out with. And being right across from the school, I mean, they just they just come over onto the green and if I'm outside, they can talk to me easier. So I'm hoping it goes smoothly. We'll find out soon. Krista, are you going to be requiring registration for the kits and the space, or is it sort of a first come first serve? So we've been debating that. Um, I think the first week we're going to do um, first come first serve to get in the building. And then I was able to stretch my budget enough to make, I think like every kit, I can make at least 20 to 25. And that's going to be a first come first served. Um, but we've already determined that if it gets really crazy and it, set, it, it seems to be the same kids over and over that get into the building, we will do a registration type format. We've already thought about that. And we use um, You Can Book Me already for people to schedule appointments to come browse in the building. So I'm sure we'll probably use that platform and have it blocked off just for the teens to register. And I think school in Pelham is starting right after Labor Day. And the kids do have to wear masks. Yeah, we have a mask policy. Everyone, if they're in the building, has to wear their mask. Um, it was approved by the town and by the town lawyer. Uh, and it hasn't been an issue so far, fingers crossed, no one has said anything, but um, hopefully, and the, there's a policy for the schools too that the, they have to wear masks in the school as well. And when the teens are in the building in the afternoon, is that, it's just for the teens at that time, is that correct? Or will there be other patrons in the building? So it's priority given to the teens, I'm expecting that it's going to get filled up with just teens, but walk-ins can come in if there is space for browsing. Um, I don't think there will be though, but we, we have kept curbside up, up and we plan to continue curbside as long as we need to. So people will still be able to get their things and we've been doing curbside printing and curbside faxing and just having them put it in an envelope and telling us what they need and us doing the copies for them and doing the faxes for them so i'm hoping that besides computer usage that um people can still get their books or or their resources that they need and it's only from 2 30 to 5 which during normal times is mostly just teens anyways so only be a few people who need to adjust i think that's great. Any other questions for Krista? Awesome. I have a few good ideas for grab and go kids now. Thanks. <laughs> no problem. All righty. Um, so next up is Stacy DeRosiers from the Gosstown Public Library. I think also talking about some team ideas. Yep. Hello. Um, so Unlike Pelham, we are not right near our school. And so prior to COVID, um, we actually probably saw quite an ebb in um, our teens coming into the library and, and you know, teen programming. Um, oftentimes we had very, you know, one to no people show up. So then COVID struck and I was like, no, because <laughs> I was going to use summer reading to like bump everything up. But um, we moved to, for the teens, doing um, YouTube videos. And I think for part of that was that they could come to YouTube whenever they felt like it, watch it when, you know, it's convenient for them. Um, and one of the things I did was um, a life skill. So I actually did uh, multiple weeks of learning how to cook and using my kitchen to do that. So learning how to make um, a boiled eggs and then onto snacks like your own homemade mozzarella sticks, your own salsa. Um, and so on YouTube, obviously that's hard to gauge your audience and who's actually watching it. But the wonderful thing was I actually got emails for, from quite a few teens um, in our community that said they loved watching it. They loved seeing my house, my dogs, like running around the kitchen, all that kind of stuff. So moving into summer um, reading, I actually did a whole snack portion also that was tied to um, missions and event codes. And so they could get um, points for watching the event on YouTube. And in, in the video, I would give them the event code in there, but it was a, at a different point each time um, to kind of make them watch the whole thing. And then I also had um, team to go bags that went with um, crafts that were also part of the summer reading and I did videos for each of those crafts as well. So inside the bag, they got um, detailed instructions and pictures 
but then they also could make it along with me on YouTube and then snap their picture um, up onto Read Squared and then they would get points in the mission portion and then also points for watching the YouTube. Um, and so I had 10 consistent um, teens doing that and so I was really, really excited. And one thing they told me is that they wanted to continue to see those um, life skills videos. So going into fall, I'm actually going to continue life skills and we're gonna move it into, do you know how to um, fill up your gas tank? Do you know which side of the car it's on? How can you tell when you're inside? Do you know how to do laundry? So we're gonna make, I'm going to make some fun little YouTube videos um, all about those different essential life skills that you need to know. And then I'm also gonna continue with um, the teen to go crafts. Uh, but instead of having one every week, it will be one for the month. Um, and those can be picked up. Again, we had specific times for them to come and pick them up and they pick them up on the library lawn. So we would be outside um, waiting for them. Um, so that is something that I'm gonna continue with going into fall as well. Um, <clears throat> and then another thing that I have just started is um, doing a Google form for book bundles, because we do have curbside. Um, and so they can fill out this Google form for the book bundles. And for their first book bundle, um, they're also going to get a stress relief kit inside their bundle. Um, and that will be some, you know, like a homemade um, stress ball. And then I have a whole rolled up um, thing of those bubbles for packing. And so I'm just going to cut them into sheets and, you know, pop a few of those bubbles when you're stressed a little bit and then some hot cocoa or tea so just a nice little pack inside there so that um, they can relieve some stress but that's kind of that's what Gosstown has going on right now okay so what type of teen crafts are you doing so over the summer I had the teen crafts kind of go along with um, Imagine Your Story. So we had um, wand making, we made catapults. Um, on Facebook, I even had extra things where I, you know, taking an Easter egg and how you can make it into a dragon egg. So going into fall, um, I'm looking at doing mug recipes. So they'll get a mug and that's something I already have. So I have in my basement a whole thing of mugs from my mother-in-law. They're just white mugs. Um, so I will print up uh, three different mug recipes that will be inside there. And then I'll also have a YouTube video for that, making one of the um, mug recipes. In, the, in October, it's going to be um, rotten dragon jars, which is a mason jar with a silhouette of a dragon inside. And then you make the outside um, kind of old and distressed uh, using paint. Um, and then in November, I believe I had scented candles for that one um, to go home. And then I can't remember what I was looking at for December. But ultimately, majority of supplies will be in the, cream, um, the teen craft bags. And then they'll have just some, a few things that they might need to supply from home, like glue or um, scissors, those types of things. And nothing will be returned. These are for them to keep. So we, um, they didn't have to sign up for picking up the bags. We basically said it was while supplies last, first come, first serve, here's where um, we'll be. And I did that through Facebook. Um, we do send out a teen newsletter each month. So it was um, between Facebook, the teen newsletter, um, and then just word of mouth. And I did have par some parents actually reached out to me um, asking about what was going to be going on for summer reading. Since we learned a little bit later about getting Read Squared, we you know, held off later than we normally would for starting our summer reading. So I had parents that actively reached out to me asking what was going on. So I was able to talk to them right then too. So I had enough supplies to make 20. And in the beginning, I was putting together 20 every week, and I think the first week I had 11 go out. Um, and so then the second week I did 20 again, 
Um, but consistently 10 ended up going out. So that's what I stuck with. Um, and then I figured anything extra, I can just um, revisit another time or bring them back out and reuse them. That's great. Any last questions for DC? I will say I really um, enjoy your YouTube idea. I remember the first time I pumped gas after I got my license, I, had, I didn't know how to do it. it was, I was so embarrassed. Like, so I had to come over and like show me how to pump my gas. So um, yeah, it's mortifying. So that's a great idea. I love that. Um, all right. Next up, um, we have Julia Lanter from the Extra Public Library and Deborah Dutcher from the State Library, who are going to talk a little bit about the T3 training. And let me uh, get you screen sharing permission. Okay, good afternoon. <laughs> Julia, you were going to talk about the T3 project, correct? Yes, as soon okay. as I can get my mic on. Okay, let me do this this way. There we go, all right, okay, mic is on. Good, sorry about that. I can't see what you guys see. So T3, train the trainers. We are super excited. Debbie and I have been doing, well, I felt like going back to grad school, we've been um, transforming, aw, our transforming the teen services program um, from um, in-person to online classes. Um, so far, Debbie has had trainings for both the connected learning and for the um, computational thinking, and I've also done computational thinking. Um, so we're actually going to be offering that up first to the YALS exclusive. So if you're a member of YALS, um, or if you're not, it's a great time to become a member of YALS. Um, that will be offered um, up first. Um, and then um, we're going to have, um, that we're going to have continuing into the winter months um, some additional trainings. What is T3, this thing that I'm talking about? Um, the American Library Association and the Chief Officers of State Library Agencies, or COSLA, um, are trying to change the way we think about librarianship in general. So these are classes to really um, get you thinking about how we work with teens, train teens, and also train the rest of our staff. Um, so the first one that we're going to be doing is computational thinking, which to me sounds very, very complicated. Um, but it's just a way of saying break, how, teaching teens how to break down problems into more manageable, smaller um, problem solving um, problems to solve. Um, so that one is coming up um, in September, and again, that'll be exclusively for y'alls. So I hope that you guys can join us for that. Um, but this is a great opportunity for us if it's been a while since you've taken any courses. Um, it's totally free, um, and it's a great way to refresh yourself on what's cutting edge for how to educate teens and um, help them not just with within your library, but also at life. Um, so that's coming up, um, and we hope that you guys join us. There'll be more information about specific dates and times to come. We just wanted to kind of give you guys a little taste to let you know that that's coming up for your winters. Um, Debbie, anything else to add before we kind of transition? Uh, no, I think that's great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so tag, you're it. I'm going to put up a okay. slideshow for you. Okay. So when the COVID-19 crisis began, um, many public librarians uh, rushed to support the youth um, in their communities with eBooks. Um, you started curbside um, pickup as soon as you could. You're doing the um, take and makes, uh, providing Wi-Fi. You're, you're doing virtual meetups, having gaming opportunities and escape rooms. Um, 
you've done great. I mean, you didn't have much time to think about the big picture. Um, uh, you've reacted and you provided what you could under the circumstances. So we've had a few months of all this going on. And meanwhile, uh, librarians everywhere, this is um, what I'm going to be talking about is not um, New Hampshire Central. This is something that's happening in libraries, conversations that's going on all, all over the place. Um, we started asking ourselves, what does my local community really need? Um, how can I reach the most vulnerable who are most likely I'm not engaging with virtually? Uh, how do we collect data and stories um, during the pandemic to show that we are engaging with our community? Um, and um, why I am presenting <laughs> what I'm presenting today, um, how can we communicate communicate to our funders that we are fulfilling our immediate needs that the community is facing. So uh, I think it was in June, um, School Library Journal formed this COVID-19 reimagining youth librarianship project and over 150 librarians all over um, the United States have participated. I think we have about five or six right here from New Hampshire. Um, Julia is participating, Gretel, um, Gail from Keene, uh, Kaler, I believe I, I saw on there. Um, I'm actually going to put in, so I posted a couple weeks ago, a couple articles about the project on my blog. And so I, um, this link I just put in the chat is to my blog, which has the two articles. The first article that explains about the, um, the project. The second article is um, in a few months where we we came to that um, that maybe curbside pickup is not um, not the only answer. Um, so if if you could have a look at those, it would give you a little more insight to the project. Now, just uh, we've been meeting by Zoom um, every couple of weeks, and there's been different presenters. Um, it's been on um, connecting with your community. Um, there's been some uh, about equity. And uh, this last week, um, Beth Yoke, um, I'm sure, uh, I think she's a past YALSA president. So you may be familiar with her name. Uh, she's the chief strategy officer at the Public Library of Cincinnati. And um, she presented this rethinking our role to better serve the community during and beyond times of the crisis. And so instead of trying to like regurgitate her um, presentation, I contacted her and said, can I just present your presentation? <laughs> you know, why reinvent the wheel? So, um, and she was more than happy to share her slides. So uh, I don't expect that everyone is going to um, agree and I don't ask everyone to agree with the opinions um, from this presentation. But I hope that you um, will maybe think a little bit differently and um, be open to any new possibilities from this presentation. Um, next slide. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I have to tell you all, I just rushed home from the office because I, I received a, a new um, laptop so I could have um, video capability. So I says, oh, okay, good. I'll do this at, you know, at the library. And so I, I logged on at one o'clock. And so I made sure I had a headphone, but I had no microphone. And I was like, I, I'm, <laughs> I says, I'm just not dealing with this. I live 10 minutes away. So I jumped in my car and ran home. So yeah. <laughs> okay. So what is a public servant? A public servant is somebody that's funded by the taxpayers. Um, we're outwardly focused on welfare of the public in our society. And characteristics are um, sense of duty, we're empathetic, we have integrity, we're future focused, collaborative, outwardly focused on our community. Um, we use an equity lens and we're committed to personal growth. Next slide. It's super slow. I apologize, folks. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. 
So we can all agree that um, we strive to embody those characteristics that I just read off, okay? Um, but perhaps we have strayed from our purpose and our focusing as library servants instead of public servants. So are we public servants or library servants? A public servant is focused on the community members and needs, where a library servant is focused on the facilities and the stuff in them. Our outreach, a public servant listens to the community, where library servants are uh, being the expert who tells people about our stuff and our greatness. Public servants identify issues and align resources to address the needs. Library servants promote books and materials we select. And public servants co-create solutions that empower community members, where library servants host programs that feature stuff. Next slide. So how can we shift from being a library servant to a public servant? Well, here we are. Change our mindsets. Make it not about the stuff. Listen, learn, repeat. Leverage community assets and lead from wherever you are. Next slide. OK, so on changing our own mindset, what can we do? OK. Um, Embrace the public servant ethos. Align your time and energy to, to address the community needs. Get outside your library bubble. Um, actively, actively seek out see, um, professional development. So something like um, what Julia just talked about a few minutes ago, the T3 project. Um, challenge the status quo. And it's really not about us, our library, or our stuff. Next slide. So I love the, the little picture in the corner, Winston Churchill, never let a good crisis go to waste. All right, so make it not all about the stuff. So change, we need to change the community's mindset that the library's main purpose is to house and hand out books and other stuff. So if we're not about the stuff, what are we about? Um, community developers, all right? We want to be connecting, fostering relationships within our community, um, creating opportunities, removing barriers. Now, I know that um, removing barriers, a lot of you were handing out um, library cards virtually. But again, here's the question, how are we reaching those that are not online. Um, I'm not going to read all the slides, so um, you can. Um, yep. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay. So um, it, it's really important that we we need to think about these things, and it's time to modernize. And uh, you know, we don't want to become obsolete. Um, Time. I, I think the reason, one of the reasons I really wanted to do this presentation is because I think the time really is of the essence. Um, I know I was asked two months ago to kind of justify what I do at my job, and we're uh, being asked to cut a, a large percentage of our budget. And I, I'm, I, I know what's happening in other states all over you know, all over the United States. And and um, I, I suspect it's probably happening in your communities. You're being asked to um, to cut quite a bit. So um, it, it's time that we really need to um, talk, have, have these talks and come up with a plan for our community. Okay. So I, I, I've done a lot of talking in the past about having community partners. And um, if you don't have them now, you, you really should be thinking about reaching out now, OK? Um, we need to connect with other people. Uh, number three. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> OK. 
um, because this is how we're going to reach those people that we're not seeing at the libraries. We're, we need to connect with the schools. We need to connect with our homeless shelters. We need to connect with our food pantries, the, the place that the, um, people are going. Okay, number four. Okay, so the library is simply not going to have as great an impact if we're operating in a silo, okay? We need to seek out these community assets and we need to work together. Um, the community is much bigger than just our own personal networks. So this doesn't fall just on the library director or the library trustees. This to, leadership roles can come from anybody in the library, okay? It may be your janitor or your person that comes in to check out books two hours a week that has that connection with the food pantry or has the connection at the school. You want to leverage those, those, those people and connect, um, use them as a connection between the library and these other partners. Um, okay, number five. I'm really going through this really fast because I know <laughs> we don't have a lot of time, but this presentation is on my blog. And I also, this morning, I just received a really great sheet from the Howard Institute about um, reaching out to your community and meeting their needs as well. And I, I put that um, info sheet um, in the same blog, uh, the, that little piece. Okay, so lead from wherever you are, okay? Um, again, this is for anybody, anybody in your library. We are all leaders, okay? Um, so, lead wherever you are, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, so next slide. I'm not going to read the slides. It's, I don't need to do that. Uh, oh, go back one. Okay, so here are some resources that um, Beth had given during her presentation. And I went to all of them, and the engaging local government leaders I, I found um, especially good. So you might want to check that one out. So I know that this is a really stressful time. It's stressful for all of us. But um, if we don't answer the call, we just may be the architect of our own demise. Um, we, we just can't lead our libraries and our community the way that we've, we know. These are new times. We need, to, we need to think differently and do things differently. So. Um, it's good to be having these conversations and, and coming up with new plans. Um, I, I know this is really overwhelming and I, you're all doing the, I don't want anybody to think that you're not doing a good job. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. I, it's, I just, I, I'm really fearful knowing that, I think we're only just seeing the tip of the economic iceberg the, what's what's going to happen and i i'm just really fearful for for us all okay so I, I think it's time that we start having these really difficult conversations about where we're going from here um so i i just wanted to kind of start the conversation and it, it is okay to be to be fearful and and stressed out it, and like i said it is overwhelming but um you know we need to start taking little bites here and there and and like I said, I think we're kind of, we're gone past the time where we can't stop, we, we, we have to talk about it and move forward. So that's all I have to say. Julia, you want to add anything to this? <laughs> I, I will say, well, obviously Debbie is, is doing such a great job with the state library and the state librarians are fighting such a, a big battle on all of our behalfs that I think that we as individual librarians, we have to make sure that we 
our community strong. I think we have to make sure that we're getting the message out there that libraries are vibrant, we're important, we're not static, we're changing with the times. Look at how much all of us, I mean, raise your hand if you were a Zoom newbie in February and are now with Zoom X. Yes, look at those hands go up. And I, I'm sure all of you with your, your screens off are also raising your hands. This is a really hard time. Raise your hand if you're also exhausted <laughs> and stressed and have anxiety and might have yelled at someone who you didn't mean to yell at either at home or at work. You know, we all have, have difficult times. Um, and what, what I think this project with School Library and Gretel absolutely has been, been a part of this too, so if she wants to chime in as well. Um, the point of this is to get communities talking, to get us outside just our own building, get side, outside of our old head and our whole like concept of what it is to be a librarian. I, this is changing. And I think that we, we need to decide now if we're going to be saying, I saw that things were changing, I was part of the, the battle right at the beginning, right at the get-go to, to help libraries survive, or was I someone who stayed back and waited and watched and then it was too late? So I hate to, I hate to be sounding the battle alarms, <laughs> but I think that we as New Hampshire librarians need to stand strong, stand together. And I think that's why NHLA and the State Library are going to be essential because we have to make sure that we're communicating not just to our own communities, but to the entire state, how important libraries are. Gretel, I'll get off my soapbox. Did you want to add anything? <laughs> so I can get on my own soapbox. Um, I would say, so I I learned about this reimagining libraries project like a little later. And so I didn't get in on the beginning of it. Um, but I think it's been um, really important and empowering in terms of it being okay for us to pause and really think about what our overarching like vision and goal is because really the idea of outreach and improved community relationships and organizational relationships and relationships with our schools is something that we've always wanted to do better and honestly we have an opportunity right now to to really run with that i think and to look at all of those areas what keeps coming up is um what are the populations we're not serving and we're not reaching is um digital is virtual programming actually equitable in in some ways it seems that we're able to reach some families that maybe couldn't get to the library before but in many ways we are not reaching um huge segments of our community and so how do we do that better how do we reach these um organizations and so that so i think for us and as a as our a team here at the person public library we're we're used to just doing and so like most libraries we jumped right into trying to find ways to offer our traditional programming in a virtual way and it's um it serves it serves a purpose. I don't think that it was um, wasted time, but I do think that we are really stepping back from that going into the fall and looking at this at this bigger picture of really what do families and students need and trying not to make assumptions that we know what they need because I'm not sure that they necessarily know what they need right now. In our community, things are changing in the blink of an eye like one day you think the school plan is this and the next day it's this and families are really overwhelmed so um so it's been helpful for again it does feel a little bit like grad school especially the reading but i think one that i really connected with um was a couple of weeks ago and there's an article that was in a Yale set, the Journal of Research on Libraries and Young Adults about designing of the library of the future for and with teens. And so it's taking the idea of a teen advisory board and expanding it further and really having teens involved um, in a way. And how do you do that in a virtual, in a virtual universe that we live in right now? So, so uh, sorry, I don't want to go on and on either. But I think in in summary, I think it, like I said, it's empowering to think about taking a step back finding ways to be better listeners in our communities, um, to partner with organizations that are meeting parents in underserved communities in ways that we are not, and finding ways that we can partner and be helpful with them in terms of programming resources um, and, and materials, which I do think um, are important as well. So that's what I got. Thanks, Gretel. <laughs> yes, thank you. So I think that just, does anyone have any questions or does this stir up any ideas or emotions or 
our cat. I'm not sure. Is there someone behind us? I thought this was open discussion time. Yeah, thank you, Julia and, and Deborah and Gretel for sh for starting that um, conversation. I will turn over to Azra now, um, as we are going to chat and network because we miss seeing each other in person. Uh, even me, the introvert, misses seeing you all in person. Yes, and um, just to make a note, uh, if anyone is feeling a little overwhelmed, just remember to take things step by step. Um, especially no matter how long you've been in your position, whether it's a year like me or 10 years or 15, um, you know, community members are changing all the time. Connect with the ones that want to connect with you. I know it sounds obvious, but we all try so hard to connect with the people who don't want to connect with us, um, especially the ones that are terrible at email. So really focus on those relationships that you see thriving. And again, remind yourself that you're one person, you're part of a team. Um, your team has many moving parts, including your, uh, your director. So that is another separate relationship. So just reminding everyone, take a deep breath, especially as we're trying new technologies and, and new things. Um, so, kind of transition that conversation. Um, one of the questions to open up is, how is your library adapted best to the pandemic? Um, thinking about that, I guess I'll start. Um, we've been kind of doing trial and error. We started with Facebook Live, and now we're gonna be trying to do Zoom in the fall rather than trying to do Facebook Live and Zoom and every other imaginable thing, just to have kind of one set uh, fixed variable or whatever the science -y term is for it. Um, so curious to see or hear what others have adapted. I'll speak. <laughs> um, I think in the beginning of the pandemic, um, I felt like for our library, we're trying to do multiple different platforms to try to figure out what works and it just kind of became too much. So I agree with you that it's best to stay with like one type of thing. And so um, weekly I've been holding a Zoom story time during the summer reading program. So I'm gonna continue doing that. And I've had a lot of um, repetitive patrons coming to that. Um, and so um, I think we're just kind of adapting to that and hopefully doing more outdoor um, programs and adapting mm -hmm. to having outside and kind of battling with all of the um, weather. I mean, as we all know, it's going to get cold soon. So this winter might be, you know, a little bit different uh, for programs. So um, now um, the oldest I have is a kindergartner. Um, the youngest I have is a three-year-old, <laughs> um, and I have probably um, a solid six kids that attend it right now, um, so that's been nice. Um, but yeah, that's what I have to say for, for a library. Um, I only have an issue with connection. Um, I found that our library, the Wi-Fi is kind of spotty. And so um, I work from home on Tuesdays. And so that's when I have Zoom story times. Um, one thing that I have for the kids not staying focused is um, this past summer for the summer reading program, I um, had the grab and go crafts. So a lot of the times, like the younger um, one, the three-year-old, um, the grandmother will have her sit at a table and like have already been starting the craft. And so she'll pay attention to the Zoom story time while she's doing the craft. And that's really helped. So. OK. Um, yeah. OK, thank you, Kat. All right, perfect. So yeah, it, again, playing it by ear seems to be what we're all doing. <laughs> Having a plan B, a plan C, which I know for the big planners in our group is probably pretty frustrating because you don't know what's going to happen next week or next month um, in your community or uh, in our state. Um, and so 
kind of thinking about that, what has been sort of the hardest um, thing for your library operating right now? Um, this is kind of your chance to sort of be like, ah, <laughs> this is frustrating. Uh, whether it's trying to adapt to curbside or um, programming, whatever it may be, what has been the hardest for you? <clears throat> I'd say the biggest thing for all of us here is we just miss the kids. <laughs> we just miss yeah. having those real life interactions with them. Even our middle school students who are driving us absolutely bonkers right before cope. Like I'd give anything for them to be able to come in and drive us bonkers again right now. And so I would say, um, I think for a lot of us, that is just the biggest challenge is missing those personal connections with all of the kids. Yeah, and even the parents too. I miss the parents. I miss talking to adults. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and the kids, it's, yes, missing the kids so much. Um, and you get really excited to talk to kids. I was talking to my neighbor's granddaughter, you know, outside, socially distant and everything. And I was like, what are you reading? What are you watching? Like, can I read you a story? And she's like, nine. So, <laughs> yes, yes, the kids definitely are. So holding on to that um, is important. Uh, and then what about reader's advisory? I've seen some pretty interesting ways that libraries and librarians have been doing reader's advisory, whether it's YouTube videos or takeout menus um how have you been doing that i just have to ask because anyone does this is facebook has all these posts about how you can make your virtual um story room and like and you use like, oh, yeah. google slides i'm obsessed does anyone do that yet not yet no yeah bitmojis yes with bitmojis yes yeah i haven't done that yet but we use our bitmojis on um on our takeout menu and we've printed our bitmojis and we're hanging them in like the kind of viewing area does everyone know what that is too because i hate it when so i'm always embarrassed to be the only one who has no idea what we're talking about and it's frequently me does everyone know what no, no that's important that go do you want to explain what it is so if you, um, you can actually create like a slide, like in Google Slides, a, um, a virtual room with links to like virtual, like um, one had like bears. So it had like brown bear, brown bear video that you clicked on the teddy bear and it would take you to the brown bear, brown bear um, video display. They could also have teachers like um, recording their own voices. And um, oftentimes they would, as the room, try to recreate the room that they have for story time and you can actually do searches for pictures and and like add them into like a, a static background slide and then the bitmoji that's a um a thing online where you can actually make, create your own virtual doppelganger so it's you only cute and kind of graphical so they kind of combined um find those two sorry Ezra I totally stepped over you no 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 go ahead no 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 <laughs> that's fine and, and you can switch it up and um you can add it on everything. So posters and video slides and um, and whatnot. You can make yourself like in a bear costume or, you know, sitting on a, a mushroom reading a book. Um, just kind of, you end up having a little bit more fun, you think, with this than the people looking at it. Yeah, using a green screen and pick photos. Yep. So that's another perfect way to do it. Um, and if you're on Facebook, there is, uh, I believe in Storytime Underground, there are people who have kind of little tutorials of how to do the uh, classrooms. So that's been an interesting way to, to freshen it up. Um, and one other um, thing that someone uh, suggested to me uh, for kind of a transition from fall to winter and when it becomes too cold is camping kits for families so kind of the takeaway craft but make it for the entire family and it can just be a one-time thing it can be like december january february and you can have um 
pack of playing cards. You can have a s'mores kit in there and you can have a virtual component to it. Like make your fort and come hang out with the librarians while we read stories and you know, make our s'mores, um, that kind of stuff. So that's something that could be, especially if you have multi-generational kind of library, that's something that you can do all all together. And plus adults enjoy that too. So something something else to think about for, for programming. Um, so resources, um, I know a lot of us have um, purchased like Hoopla, um added books to libby what other if you haven't heard of a resource um that's been mentioned that either your library has purchased or acquired um feel free to let us know um especially with all these things that keep coming out um feels like every other week you hear about a new service they're so like i didn't know that even existed oh wait it didn't We have um, Canopy now, which I think a lot of libraries have, which is a, vi a streaming yeah. video service. Um, and our school, this has nothing to do with us, but I want to share because it's amazing. Our school librarians have a pop-up library. I shouldn't say it's nothing to do with us. We sometimes work with them, but it's really, it's really their thing and they're amazing. Um, and they have a pop-up library with books that um, kids could actually like write in a Google form and request titles and they would bring them to their homes, which was really amazing. Like, talking about equity and people who can't get to our building. Um, that was one way. I know I think the Manchester Public Library has a bookmobile and I'd be interested to hear if other libraries are doing that too. Um, yeah, Hoopla is awesome. Lynn, just, yes. she got Hoopla for her library. Yes, in Litchfield, I think. Um, oh, a bike bookmobile, wow. That's amazing, I love that. Do you, do you drive it? Does the librarian drive it? I think Ben's about to speak. Uh oh. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, okay. So it's like an actual bike. That's pretty cool. Now I feel like I've seen everything. Yeah, um, that yeah, that's okay. Uh, for Hoopla, uh, if you one way that our library um, promoted it was doing seven 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 uh, types of books or something like that on Hoopla, and you just created like a Google Doc, a live Google Doc, and you kind of found books, you know, fantasy, um, you could do this for children's, teens and adults, but you could do fantasy, um, historical fiction, just a way for um, people to click Hoopla and explore it a little bit. Uh, who drives the bike? Oh. Can we have a picture? Well, you we might not be able to send it here, but we can post it on NHLA because I think that would be pretty cool. Ah, okay. That's, yep. And I think if you're uncomfortable with that, err on the side of caution. Um, really with anything that you do. I know it's difficult, especially when you see other libraries doing awesome stuff, but if your community feels uncomfortable with something, just err on the side of caution. Um, so how have you been reaching out to schools during the pandemic? This probably doesn't speak well to uh, to me as a as an assistant director, but I've been using our pages as mules and um, just having them be our inside people. I actually said I'm making you a spy. 
your job is to tell me like all the inside information that's going on and it's worked surprisingly well um so they kind of report to me every week on what's been going on and what the parents are saying we've been making national news because people are giving death threats to teachers how lovely exeter um about uh, we're doing all virtual and um the parents are stalking teachers here and taking photos of them with their masks off to prove that they uh should be in school yeah and i also live in portsmouth and cat and gretel can probably tell you how fun it is there too uh, and um, so in Gothstown, we will be having actually a meeting next um, month, so in September, with um, our middle school and high school librarians. They're, they're a little unsure what's going on right now, too, but we definitely have decided that we need to kind of pool together um, to help make sure that we have materials that can get out to um, students when things start going up. Because um, I do think it is going to be mainly virtual here, and so they might not have access um, to the school library. So we will be meeting together um, virtually to, to go over some type of plan where we can work together. Yeah, we also just had a meeting with all of our, so I went to a meeting with all of our school librarians um, who are really just at the beginning of like, uh, is our space even gonna be a library or is it gonna be a classroom space when kids are in school or for how long? Let's start the pool on how long this even lasts um, in Portsmouth anyway. And then um, also talking about interlibrary school. So we share uh, an ILS system and usually share books back and forth. So how do we ease that? Because I think all of those librarians are doing deliveries to families, which we are not doing. So I am happy to get as much material to them as easily as possible to get out to families who can't get here. Um, so we also learned that parents are in need of technology support, like they are being asked to use all these platforms for their kids that they have no idea how to use. Um, as well as hotspots. We also, I just had a meeting with our director and the principal of the middle school because we get upwards of um, fit some days 50 to 60 middle school kids here after school, which is not an option um, this fall, obviously. And so talking with them about what their plans are for after school um, activities and whether there's sports and how we partner with the rec department, if there's any way that we can offer things outdoors um, for them or just even getting the word out to parents that, you know, this isn't a space they're not going to be able to use this space in a way that they're typically used to. Um, and we're also talking about ways to reach out to teachers as well. But what we heard from the school librarians is that the teachers were so overwhelmed that they didn't even know what they needed for help. That like asking for help was like, it's sort of another burden. Like we're here to help you. How can we help was actually another burden like on them to be like, I have no idea how you can help me. I don't know what I'm doing in the next minute. And given that Portsmouth's plan changed literally overnight, and the principals and the teachers had no knowledge that it was happening. Everything is like in just a total state of chaos here right now. So I think just having those conversations start is, is feeling like a success right now. Yeah. Yeah. And as, especially here, here in Wyndham, the plan keeps changing. So it might change tomorrow. It changed last week. Um, so, and, and we have, four schools so we have you know four different librarians and you know with varying relationships and communication so just even saying we're here we can help you because um sometimes you hear about these amazing school librarian and public librarian relationships and you're kind of like how do i do that um without you know coming off as you know condescending or you know, a burden or whatever, um, uh, just kind of saying, you know, these are the resources that we offer. If there's any way that we can bring these resources to your kids, um, I think is one way, but if anyone has better ideas or ideas that they've seen that have started to work, um, let us know. Go ahead. Um, I have had a very hard time trying to connect with um, the school in Stratford, as Kat knows. <laughs> um, so I found that it's much easier to go to the actual teachers than the school librarian or the administrators. Um, they're opening for full time um, with option of remote learning right now. Um, and so when the pandemic started, I actually had a teacher that reached out to me and asked if I could do a weekly story time with her class. Um, and so I think that might be a good way to try to reach out to other teachers 
and it might be a way to up your numbers too for um, programming and be able to get your face out there in the community. Um, so I'm planning on reaching out to um, the group of teachers that I that I have a connection with and yeah. um, going from there. Our SAU, um, we just have a new interim um, superintendent. Um, and uh, so I'm planning on reaching out to her because she seems very um, community oriented and um, want, really wanting the children to continue reading and everything from her speeches that she put online. So that's awesome. Thank you. Oh, and also join, if you are on Facebook, join the librarians of the 603 group, the NHLA and the school um, librarians group are trying to do more together um, to kind of bridge that gap that has kind of been there um, and to share more information. So if you do have questions, post it there. Um, so far, it's been good. Okay, so um, does anyone want to share a happy story? <gasps> I will. Uh, a patron came into the library and she said she had obviously her mask on. We've been doing limited browsing. And she's like, oh my gosh, me and the girls have missed you so much. Um, you know, I'm just so glad to see you. And I had no idea who it was. Couldn't tell you. I'm terrible with faces. Now I'm even worse. And I was like, I've missed you too, ma'am. And that happened to me the other day. She had a mask and sunglasses on, no kids with her. And she was like, the kids and I have been loving, you know, it was great to hear that they've been loving what we've been doing, but I could not place her voice and <laughs> nothing so I get that but um, I yeah. think like Gretel was saying earlier we keep talking about how much we miss seeing the kids and the one nice thing about being out front for the curbside pickup is sometimes they come to get their books and we get to see them and see how they're doing um, which has been really great and um, I was super nervous about zoom story times but I actually loved doing them um, just to see the little little people on the screen it was really great yeah yeah, um, getting some some stuff in the chat, but uh, Lori mentioned doing the the curbside and the grab and go, which I think is gonna continue definitely at our library because our patrons of little kids love it too. Um, especially when we pick the book books, we've been doing mystery grab bags, so the parents just tell us three year old likes fairies, and so far it's been nothing but good feedback. The parents are not picky. Um, so that's been good. Yeah. So are there any other questions, um, comments? What else would you like to see from y'alls and CLNH? TikTok, I don't know. Well, if you think of anything, you can always email us as well. If yes. Coming to mind, then you have a realization. Programming discussions are always welcome. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. So maybe we'll do one before the winter, just kind of to touch base. Um, and see what gears are shifting in people's minds. Okay. Well, thank you for all to all our presenters too. Um, yes, thank you. I am very inspired by all of you. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.